we normally do this in the dressing room, but in full public view now. Okay, I think we're ready to go. So welcome everybody, those who are here physically, those who are present online. Um, I've been asked to do a presentation on personal encounter with Jesus. And so sometimes I use a PowerPoint, but I thought, no, that would defeat the purpose. It's about personal encounter with Jesus. So let's get rid of everything that might somehow be an obstacle to that person-to-person -person relationship. And if I'm going to speak about a personal relationship with Jesus to you, I really need to be in a personal relationship with you. And so maybe somehow expose something of my personal relationship with Jesus. What would I like you to take from this evening? I'm not encouraging you to be more committed. I'm not encouraging you to be more pious. I'm not encouraging you to be more involved in the life of the church. All these things might be included, but what I'm encouraging you to do or to desire is to have a more personal faith and a more personal relationship with Jesus. Because really that is the heart of the matter from which everything else grows. Our personal relationship with Jesus is the seed of our own spiritual life. And from there, it becomes the seed of the church. So what I want to do is hang what I'm going to say on three quotes. And these three quotes come from the last three popes. In fact, it's the words that St. John Paul, John Paul II, in his very first encyclical, the very first line of his very first encyclical. So we'd like to know what that is, wouldn't we? The very first line of his very first encyclical. He'd been waiting all this time to be Pope, and then he was going to say something to the world, and we want to hear his first line. Then we're going to hear a quote from Pope Benedict's first Mass as Pope. So once again, we want to hear what was on Pope Benedict's heart as he took up this position of leadership of the Universal Church. What did he want to say up front that in some ways gave a tagline to his whole pontificate? And then thirdly, a quote from Pope Francis, and once again, it's the very first line of his very first encyclical, Evangelium, Evangelium Gaudium. And so we want to hear what he wanted to say. So the first quote from John Paul II in 1979. The Redeemer of Man, that becomes the title of the encyclical, Redemptor Hominis, the Redeemer of Man, Jesus Christ is the center of the universe and of history. Now, this is not just his opinion. This is what he is presenting to us as the truth. And anybody who is seeking the truth, desiring to know the truth, and preparing to commit to the truth once it is found, wants to listen to those words. Jesus Christ is the center of all creation. He's not saying this is a religious truth for religious people. This is the truth of the whole of creation. If we're looking for the deepest level of reality, if we were a philosopher looking for the deepest level of reality, we would find the person of Jesus Christ, the one through whom everything was made. 
So we don't have to just listen to Pope Francis, do we? We can go back to the Nicene Creed. Through him, all things were made. And we don't have to just go back to the Nicene Creed. We can go back to St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. And St. Paul says, everything was made through him and for him. Jesus Christ, the center of the universe, the center of history, everything is created through him and for him. I think of one of those egg timers, you know, and we've got God at the top, say, and then everything is channeled down through the person of Jesus, and then creation comes into being. The one channel, I am the way, the truth, the life, everything coming down from the Father through Jesus, and then through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Once again, everything channeled back through Christ to the Father. So this is presented to us as the objective truth, not somebody's opinion, and it's either true or it's not true, isn't it? It's not, an, it's not guesswork, it's either true or, if it, or not true, and if it is true, we want to base our whole lives on this truth. Now, it's a truth that can only be known by faith. Some people don't like the idea of faith because they put too much trust in their own minds. But really, you know, not many of us are geniuses, are we? So why we trust our own minds to try and work out the most difficult things in life, I do not know. But I could tell you the truth, that in here, in this envelope, there is a piece of paper. No? Is that true or is it not true? It just depends whether you believe me, doesn't it? Well, I can assure you, you can believe me. I don't want to mislead you in any kind of way. So I can say, look, I take the piece of paper out and you're none the wiser, are you? Because you could have believed me in the first place, but it's a piece of paper. Now I could tell you that this, on this piece of paper, there's a photograph. You didn't know that, did you? And you couldn't work it out, could you? But I have told you, and I'm saying on this piece of paper, there is a photograph. Am I trying to mislead you? No, not at all. There is a photograph. Now, I could tell you even further who the photograph is a photograph of. You've no idea, have you? You can't work it out. You might have a random guess, and maybe, you know, it'd be your opinion, but, but I am telling you there is a photograph here, and if you believe me, you know the truth. Now, who's it a photograph of? Pope Francis. So we can't guess these things, can we? It has to be revealed to us. And when something is revealed to us, then we know. Now, Jesus is the revelation of the Father. He says that nobody knows the Father except me, and nobody knows me except the Father, and to those to whom the Father reveals him. So Jesus is the one who is the source of all revelation. Now, if we wish, <clears throat> we can just live in this world sort of guessing sort of what life is about and just sort of coping with problems from day to day to day and not really having a true purpose, a true sense of purpose and therefore not really having a true motivation because when things get difficult, well, we'll just try another track or another way. Or when things get a bit inconvenient, well, we'll just leave them to other people. Or we'll just take another path. 
or if people are a bit awkward, we'll just avoid them because we're not really living according to the truth, the truth as taught by Jesus. So this revelation of the truth, it's something that comes to us through the person of Jesus, and then it's handed on down to us through the church. I don't want to put this personal relationship with Jesus in opposition to everything else, because that's what sometimes we can be tempted to do. St. Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, he says, as far as the Jewish faith was concerned, I was an expert. I was a Pharisee. As far as the Jewish customs and laws were concerned, I was an expert. I was one of the best. But then he says, I've come to realize that all those advantages were actually disadvantages if only I can come to know Jesus. And for him, I have accepted the loss of everything. So he's on one of those moments, isn't he, when this personal relationship with Jesus is so strong within his heart, he'd rather throw everything else to one side. But it's not really the truth of, of who Paul is, because that great Jewish background, and that great knowledge of the scriptures helped him to write most of the New Testament, which he wouldn't have been able to do if he'd only had one blinding light and the name of Jesus put before him. But he understood the whole context. And because he understood the whole context, he was then able to be the great evangelist and the great seed of the church that he became. C.S. Lewis, who's a Christian writer, he um, thought about this same thing, about this personal relationship or the personal experience as opposed to theology. And C.S. Lewis was giving a sort of religious talk to um, a group of people. And he says that an old army captain said to him, I don't need all this dogma and all this academic teaching. When I was out in the desert, I had an experience of God, and I want to stay with that reality. And C.S. Lewis says, well, I agree with you to some degree. And then he thought of an analogy to help him understand. And he said, it's like the person who goes down to the Atlantic Ocean. They walk along the beach, they have a fantastic experience of the awe of the ocean and the waves coming in. And then they say, they don't need to look at maps or read anything about the ocean. I've had the personal experience myself. But C.S. Lewis says, but that personal experience doesn't really go anywhere unless you're happy just to keep walking up and down the beach for the rest of your life. He says, we have to go to the map of the world. We have to see the ocean. And even though the map is a sort of second-hand reality, it's not the sea itself, from the map, we can see the ocean in its context. And it's built upon the experience of all the people who have seen the sea and explored the sea, and they put together this map. We can now see that America is on the far side. We can now make our way over to the sea and get to America. So we don't want to say that the personal experience on its own is enough, but the personal experience is essential if we're going to have a faith that is alive. I'm thinking about, say, a football match, say a father, wants to introduce his son to football and he wants him to be a, a great fan, you know, and following his father's footsteps. What does he do? He doesn't give him 
the FA Football Association Book of Rules and stay, say, start learning about the game because it will kill off the son's interest. And even if the son was interested in the Book of Rules, the first time he went into, say, Old Trafford, just to use an example, for a night match, and you come out of the darkness into this tremendously lit stadium, and there are 75,000 people there all cheering, and the players come out, and the volume gets bigger. That's the excitement. That's the experience. And that's what makes the young boy want to go back to the next match and identify with the famous characters on the field and become a lifelong fan if things work out well. It does happen, doesn't it? So it's the same with our faith. Our liturgical practices, our RE education, religious education, all that we do in the church, the community of the church, parish life, and all the rest of it is all the supporting cast. Well, sometimes the supporting cast is so crowded and so strong, we can't see the main player. And the main player is the person of Jesus, the person who's at the heart of reality, the person through whom all creation came into being, the one who is the redeemer of the world, the center of the universe and the center of history. So this is what Pope Francis wanted to put forward to us when he first came to his pontificate, sorry, Pope John Paul II wanted to put to us at the beginning of his pontificate. So let's move on to Pope Benedict. In his first mass, you might have heard this, there is nothing more beautiful than to be surprised by the gospel. If we're not surprised by the gospel, we have to ask ourselves, have I heard the gospel? Because the gospel is very surprising. It's about a man who rose from the dead. I know we've become so accustomed to a, a person rising from the dead, but it's, it's a shocking, surprising truth that those who believe in it have either gone off their heads or something has touched their lives that communicates this truth to them, or they're just like a bunch of sheep and they all follow around. Well, if he's believing it, I believe it, and nobody's really making that personal choice to say this is what I believe, regardless of what anybody else believes. That wasn't part of the quote, actually. <laughs> I get dis I, dis I distract myself. Nothing more beautiful than to be surprised by the gospel, by the encounter with Christ. That's the in the title this evening, isn't it? The encounter. Meeting sounds a, a little bit officious, you know, going for the business meeting or an interview. But an encounter is coming into personal contact and relationship with another. By the encounter with Christ, nothing more beautiful than to know him and to speak to others of our friendship with him. So that this ultimate truth that the person of Jesus Christ wants to be known and wants to know us. And we can find out something about him from the church, from the tradition of the church, from the scriptures, from the sacraments, from all that we know is <clears throat> a part of our Catholic faith. But there is enormous difference between knowing about a person and knowing a person. There's not much difference when we say it, is there? To know about somebody or to know somebody. But there is 
an enormous difference in the two realities that those words express. To know about somebody or to know somebody. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a group of friends. We've all got some friends, I hope, haven't we? <laughs> and we might find ourselves in that situation where one of our group of friends in a particular situation, we find ourselves just with that person. And suddenly, this might be just my personal experience, we feel a bit awkward with them because we realize that outside of the group setting, we don't really have a, a personal relationship with them. So we feel a little bit lost about what to say. And there's a little bit of an awkwardness and, uh, and about how to relate to each other because we've only met them in the context of a group. Now, maybe this can be the same with our relationship with Jesus. We, we know him in the context of the church and in the context of all the things that we do as Catholics. But do we really know him? Because we can't know somebody until they have met us and we have met them. You know, if you were choosing somebody for a job, I don't know whether you'd rather meet them for a minute or see one of these massive long application forms that tells us all the things that they've done and all the qualifications that they've got. You know, there's something about the personal encounter that's far more powerful than knowing about a person. And I think it's very hard for us to make that distinction, even in our own hearts, about where our knowledge of Jesus has come from. Is it a revelation from the Lord that has brought things to life, or is it second-hand knowledge based on other people's experience? Now, from one generation to the next, things grow weaker, don't they? unless they are revived and renewed. And that's the job and the work of the Holy Spirit. He's reviving us and renewing us, essentially, in our relationship with Jesus. Now, we might look at the world and say, well, it's a very different world, and what should Christians be doing? Well, Christians should be doing lots of things, aren't they? Because there is a bottomless pit of problems and there is a bottomless pit that could take all the wealth of the world, and it still wouldn't be filled. But what should Christians be doing? We should be knowing Jesus and finding who we are in our relationship with him and beginning to discover that he is our friend. Nothing more beautiful than to know him and to speak to others of our friendship with him. Well, if we think about the church, there are not many conversations taking place about our friendship with Jesus and speaking to others about the beauty of this relationship. Because the Lord, he comes to us in such a sweet way that it becomes the center of our lives. We want to tell others about Jesus because we know what he can do for us and we can know what this relationship can be. So, I've written here, to feel as though we know a person is still not to know a person because there are so many ways in which we can just habitually think that we understand things but when we think more deeply into our hearts there is something that's not quite right so first-hand relationship with jesus is essential where's this first-hand relationship going to come from well Jesus is trying 
doing his best to enter into everybody's life all the time. Obviously, if we expose ourselves to the gospel, we have a greater chance of this grace flooding into our hearts. Obviously, if we have a desire to live as Jesus lived and to use him as an example and role model for our lives, there is a chance that this grace will flow into our hearts. But the real thing is to say, Jesus, I want to know you and I'm prepared to do anything and everything that you ask so I can develop this relationship with you. No holes barred. Jesus, my life belongs to you because everything was created through you and for you. He's the heart of all things. So when the Father created me, he cre created me and each one of us through Jesus. I mean, language just sort of... You can't keep up, can it? What does that mean? Through Jesus. But it means that the presence of Christ is deeply imprinted upon our lives somewhere, deeply imprinted, and it becomes like the hallmark of who we are. My deepest reality of who I am is the person of Jesus, and it's not a reality we can find by dissecting the physical being. It's a reality that we find in a relationship, in an intimate relationship, in a relationship that's growing in intimacy. As this relationship grows, there is an effect in our lives. There needs to be the Christian effect in our lives that other people are wondering what on earth has happened to them? We could, each of us, go home this night as a transformed person, not because we're going from zero to one, but because we're going from 99 to 100. We can be transformed in our lives. And people say, what's come over you? There is some change. There is some enthusiasm for the things of God. There is a new peace. There's a new joy. There's a new desire to be a person helping others. That all these things. So let's go to the first line of Pope Francis in Evangelii Gaudium. What does he say? The joy of the gospel fills the hearts and lives of all who encounter Jesus. Not all those who go to church, not all those who are committed to scripture reading, not all those who are great community people, although all these things might be included. The joy of the gospel fills the hearts and lives of all who encounter Jesus. We want to encounter him, don't we? Mm. <laughs> Honestly, we, 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 want, we want, there's nothing better than encountering Jesus. And while we're still alive, it's not too late. While we're still alive, it's not too late. We want to know what our Christian faith is about. We don't want to come to the end of our life and think, I've been a good Catholic, and something never clicked. Some, something never fell into position. Something never gave me that fire and that wind and all these things that the Holy Spirit thinks of or speaks of. So those who encounter Christ, those who accept his offer of salvation are set free from sin. Now, the Catholic Church has focused, main, mainly over-focused on sin, but set free from sin, sorrow, inner emptiness, 
and loneliness. And that's just to name a few, isn't it? There's no such thing as a Christian who's suffering from these things. Or we might be suffering from them, but we're transcending them and we're living above them. We can feel that something's irritating us, but that doesn't mean we have to stop working with it, does it? We continue with an enthusiasm that's a spiritual gift from the Lord, because otherwise we're dipping down with everything else. Those who encounter Jesus, those who accept his offer of salvation. Now, this is not, you know, your local evangelical speaking. This is the Pope. <laughs> the Pope, not only the Pope, the very first words in his very first document, what he wanted to say is an absolute priority. The joy of the gospel fills the hearts and lives of all who encounter Jesus. Those who accept his offer of salvation are set free from sin, sorrow, inner emptiness, and loneliness. With Christ, joy is constantly born anew. Now, each of us has to have this witness in our lives of what Jesus has done for us when we encountered him. Because if we haven't got that witness, maybe we haven't got that encounter because the Lord changes things. My sister's here. Did the Lord change my life? <laughs> I became unrecognizable, not to other people, to myself, because I was never interested in the things of God. I was never interested in the church. There was nothing about Catholic life that attracted my attention at all. I was more interested in guitars and music. I was interested in freedom. I was interested in travel. I was interested in all these things. Now, maybe you might say, well, I grew up. Well, I wish some more people would grow up. <laughs> because there are many retired people who are still interested in all these things and have not found what is the pearl of great price? Now, Jesus is trying to say this is something so, so precious that we want to put everything else down so we can pick this pearl of great price up. Now, I don't know what it is that everybody's looking for. I don't know what it is that everybody wants. But I saw an advertisement saying happiness is having your next holiday booked. Now, that is certainly not a revealed truth. I understand what it means. You know, I'm going away somewhere in June, so it'll keep me going for a while. And, you know, the job's a bit difficult, so it's a little bit of hope. But it's, it's not something that touches the deepest motivational areas of our lives, where we just want to know Jesus and holidays become an irrelevance. In fact, most things become an irrelevance because Jesus says, follow me, and the way is very narrow. So what's our witness? Some of us might say we're free from sin. Some of us might say we're free from sorrow. Some of us might say we're free from inner emptiness and loneliness. Well, the Lord set me free. He set me free from a purposeless life. I wanted to have something that I could commit myself to, something that was a really worthy, worthwhile cause. And I found Jesus. I don't quite know how I found him. It was through a prayer group. It was through a sharing of faith so I could see a little bit of other people's lives, that they were making this personal commitment because I heard the prayers that they spoke out loud and I could hear what was behind those prayers, this living faith. And I began to think, I want this relationship with Jesus. I want this sense of purpose. And it was in that I felt the Lord calling me to be a priest. 
No, I have no desire to be a priest whatsoever. But if I was say, okay, Lord, I want to, to do whatever it is, what you want of me, and you want me to be a priest, I'll have to do it, won't I? Won't I? Otherwise, I'd be living a second best life. And I didn't want to live a second best life. I wanted to do what the Lord wanted me to do. And for me, it was to be a priest. Now, he's not asking everybody to be a priest, but I'm sure he's asking some people to be a priest. And he, he's not saying... I always, think, I always think the Lord calls me Jed. <laughs> he says, Jed, I don't want you to be a priest because the church is in a state of collapse and we need priests. And therefore, will you sacrifice yourself and be one? That was not it. It was, Jed, I've made you to be a priest. And if you don't become a priest, you will never be happy. Whatever the state of the church, whether it's the most unsu unsuccessful church or whether it's the most successful church, I will never be happy unless I am a priest because that's what the Lord wants me to do. And all the levels of my being resisted. And so I began to realize this is sin, isn't it? resistance to God's will. That's exactly what sin is. Something's too difficult. Something's inconvenient. Something I don't want to do. Something I can't see the purpose of it. But all that is layers of sin so we can get through to this personal relationship of what Jesus wants of each one of us. Just thinking about them being a priest. He didn't say, I need a, I need a, a light bulb, so you know, anyone, anyone will do, put that one up there. It was me. And so I, now I ask myself, the bishop didn't send the priest to a parish. The bishop sent me to Nelson. So that becomes my personal vocation. Jared Kelly, priest in Nelson. Now, it might come through all the sorts of workings of the church and the bishop's discernment and all the rest of it, but I understand this is how I arrive in the situation. Now, doesn't that give me great motivation? Because God has sent me to this place. He says, while you're here, don't start thinking of all the other places that you might be and all the, all the other wonderful opportunities that might have been somewhere else. Think of this place because this is the best place for you. Because the Lord loves me. So he's not going to put me in a place that's not the best place for me. So that's what we're thinking about, this personal love of God. And when somebody's at a personal friend, they don't abuse you, do they? They don't use you. They are all the time at your service. And that's the Lord. He's all the time at our service. So we begin to think, don't we? This wonderful encounter with Jesus, this offer of salvation, setting us free from sin, sorrow, inner emptiness, loneliness, whatever it is that takes joy from our lives, the Lord wants to either take it away or give us a transcendent power so it's no longer a controlling influence over our moods. And once it's not a controlling influence over our moods, it's not a controlling influence over our behavior. So we can become people, followers of Jesus, and we can experience these things in a very powerful way in our lives. So I've already touched on it a little bit, but we know the Lord in a personal way through our personal vocation. And there are so many examples in the scriptures, aren't there? If we, if we think of Peter, you are Peter. On this rock, I will build my church. 
Well, pizza wasn't a rock at all. I always say it was a big jelly. <laughs> but the Lord said, on this rock, I will build my church. And he transformed that big jelly into a rock-like character. He wasn't looking around for a rock. He was looking around for who he could make into a rock, who was willing to have that transformation in their lives. And then later on, he said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He was giving him a, a responsibility, not just a personal call, a responsibility. In that responsibility, feed my sheep. So the, the call of Peter it's something that's developing. The first call was just simply to follow me, then to be a rock, and then to feed the sheep. And we think of John at the end of the gospel, and Peter said, what's about, what's about him, you know? <laughs> and Jesus said, don't worry about him. You know, I've got my own ways with him. So th this is our personal vocation. It be we become different from other people. According to our gifts, our talents, our background, our opportunities, our perceptions, our emotional makeup, everything that we are becomes taken up into our vocation. And I'm thinking of John at the foot of the cross. And what did Jesus say to him? Behold your mother. And I think that was John's essential vocation. Because Jesus spoke to him and said, behold your mother. And I think if John had thought, well, I can't be bothered looking after Mary. I, I want to spend my life writing the Gospels. He might have written exactly the same Gospel that we have today. But it might have been somehow hollow. It might not have had that same power to touch people if he wasn't responding to his primary vocation which was to take care of Mary, who had been gifted by Jesus at the foot of the cross. So there are lots of different ways we can serve the Lord, and some might appear more attractive than others. Some might appear easier than others. Some might have more kudos associated with them than others. But the essential thing is we all find our personal vocation in our encounter with Christ and from there the power of God can be at work and we can accomplish whatever it is that the Lord asks us to accomplish because it's not in our own strength. It's in the strength of the one who is the center of the universe the one who is the center of history, the one who reveals himself to us as a personal friend, the one who is alive within the church. And if we ask the Lord to come into our hearts, he never says no. In fact, I think the only obstacle to the gift of faith is not wanting it. I think that's the truth. If we don't deeply desire it, we don't receive it. Jesus says, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. How much more does the Heavenly Father wish to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So let's just put aside anything within us that prevents us from having this encounter with Christ that becomes the motivating desire and force within us. And we find it can be fruitful. We find that we grow as persons and we find that we grow in our ability to be channels of God's love 